On this episode of Siesta Key Miami Moves, Madison makes pancakes, Brandon eats hot wings, and the cast gets together for what could be their last brunch ever. I'm Lizzie Frizzle, and this is the Recap Corner. Today, we're talking about Season 5, Episode 12, called I'm Not Going Back to Siesta Key. It's something Juliet tells Lexi. Honestly, we might not ever be going back to Siesta Key either, because even though the show hasn't been canceled or renewed, it feels like we all just watched the series finale. This episode has one of the most staged openings I can remember the show ever attempting. It begins immediately where the last episode ended, with Sam and Jordana making out at the Emerald Ray Botanicals launch party. Everything's about to change. Honestly, I hope no one saw that. Let's go back to the house or whatever and figure it out. Yeah, whatever. That's weird. That was weird. Okay. Yeah, that's weird. Okay. If you don't want to be seen making out, then do it at the private residence where you both live. Hoping you're being discreet because you're in the corner of a room is like Ross and Rachel thinking no one would see them kissing in the secret hallway where no one ever goes. Or like an old ex-boyfriend of mine who thought I wouldn't notice him kissing another girl at a party because they were sitting down. After Sam and Jordana are finished making out, and after Sam is finished grabbing Jordana's ass, he abruptly leaves the party, leaving Jordana alone, embarrassed, and confused. Then the opening credits roll, and it's suddenly the morning after the party. Why not end the last episode with the end of the party, instead of saving literally 20 seconds of footage to use in this episode? It wasn't a satisfying reveal that Sam and Jordana were both weirded out after their kiss. It was just jarring after all the rom com build buildup to it. Anyway, the morning after the party, Sam and Mike swim in Sam's pool. Neither has seen Jordana since the night before, and they don't know where she is now. Turns out, she's at Madison and Amanda's, where Madison made everyone pancakes. Thanks for letting me crash again. You're welcome. Jordan, you should just move it, thinking about it. Jordana reveals that she and Sam haven't spoken since the kiss, and that she doesn't want to face him. Mostly, she's concerned that their dynamic as business partners is now permanently ruined, which would be terrible timing because they're finally ready to debut their faux fur clothing line, Focus, at, you guessed it, an upcoming launch party. Amanda warns Jordana that just because someone is a good friend doesn't mean they'll be a good boyfriend, too. I wonder if that's what her tattoo says. Juliet and Lexi both conduct laptop-related business at a coffee shop. Lexi is using her real estate connections to look at local Miami houses for Juliet to buy. Unfortunately, it's not a good time for Juliet to take money out of JMP in order to afford a down payment. She really wants to stay in Miami, though. Maybe the JMP pop-up will net Juliet the cash she needs. Cut to the JMP pop-up, where things aren't going as planned. An entire rack of swimwear didn't show up to the boutique. Even worse, customers aren't showing up either. And the ones that are, aren't impressed. Juliet! Nice to meet you. 
most basic styles. Yeah. This is our essential collection. Are people buying? Not really. This scene surprised me because as far as I can tell, JMP the label is a success. It's expanded to sell active and loungewear in addition to swimsuits, and the reviews I've seen online have been overwhelmingly positive. Why would Juliet willingly pretend that business was bad when really it was booming? Eventually, Amanda and Madison arrive at the boutique to show support. Can you open this? Yeah, <laughs> I had a kind of an afternoon. Are you stressing? Yeah. What's going on? So I had a whole other rack of three other collections that is not here. It didn't show up. No. This is the business, right? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. That was not planned. I've often described some of the choices made by Siesta Key's editors and producers as cartoonish, but I never expected actual cartoon sound effects like yowling cats and shattering glass to make it into the show. With the pop-up a bust and the boutique busted, Juliet's publicist Dara urges her to promote more in the future. But isn't that what a publicist is supposed to do? Later, Juliet hangs out with Jordana. She apologizes for missing the JMP pop-up, but says she had some crying to do. Juliet is understanding. I'm sorry I wasn't able to show up because okay. I had some crying to do. Oh, well, no, then it's really okay. <laughs> What's the reason for Jordana's tears? Sam. She says their kiss felt forced, like Sam was just trying to please her. Probably because their kiss was forced, and Sam only did it because he thought he was supposed to. Juliet warns Jordana that dating Sam might be a bad idea, at least until he changes, and not just his clothes. But above all else, Juliet also tells Jordana to follow her heart. So I guess we know who's hosting The Bachelor if Sam's mom and that guy from the NFL don't work out. After Juliet meets Sam at a restaurant to give him advice. If Sam isn't going to commit to dating Jordana, then Juliet urges him to stop living with her. Sam repeats one of the four things he says about the situation. That Jordana's his best friend and he doesn't want her to move out. Juliet argues that if Jordana truly is Sam's best friend, then he should recognize that their living arrangement is actively hurting her. Sam worries his lack of dating experience is preventing him from making a good decision. He shares that he's only seriously dated two people, Juliet and a woman named Brittany, whose arrival into the show was teased in an old season finale, but then Juliet and Sam broke up during the off season and the entire plotline went kaput. Does Sam's admission that he's only been in two relationships contradict his storylines this season? In reality, I know Sam and Megan were never that together, or together at all, really. But in the scripted Siesta Key universe, Sam and Megan dated for nine months. Either way, the lack of relationship experience leads Sam to the same conclusion he always comes to. That dating Jordana could mean permanently altering their friendship for the worse. At the same time, he also says it wouldn't be the first friendship he's lost after turning things romantic. His real-life vague tweeting prompts Juliet to ask an awkward question. Yeah, so, so do you still have feelings for me? Um, I mean, I care about you a lot, yeah. I get, like, deeply emotionally attached to people. That's who I am, my time. Answering questions with rambling non-answers has kind of become one of Sam's trademarks along with his money, his haircut, and his jewelry. When people ask if he wants to date Jordana, 
He talks about how incredible she is, but never says whether or not he's into her. When Juliet asks if Sam still has feelings for her, he says he still cares, but doesn't clarify if that means romantically or not. Regardless, Juliet thanks Sam for caring and wishes him well as the scene ends. It's the sort of goodbye you give to someone you're hoping to never see again. Brandon and Tanir share a meal of hot wings. Really, Brandon eats hot wings while telling Tanir that if she's hungry, she shouldn't feel self-conscious about eating in front of him. Dig in, girl. You've been working. Don't think you can't eat in front of me. Like, have some chicken wings if you want to. Brandon complains that the wings aren't Nashville hot as advertised. He brags about eating real Nashville hot wings in Nashville. But Tanir isn't into hot sauce. After learning that, Brandon might not be into Tanir anymore. Man, that ain't Nashville hot. Like, I've been in Nashville, and I've, I had Nashville hot chicken in Nashville. That is hot. I don't really, I'm not into hot sauce, so I don't really don't even know what. Why are you looking at me like that? Hot sauce is like a gift. We learn that Brandon and Tanir are going to perform their song, All I Want, at Sam and Jordana's Focus launch party. Tanir is excited to make more music together too, especially now that her dad, Ted, founder of Slip and Slide Records, is starting to see Brandon as a competent, or at least semi-competent, rapper. Ted's praise means a lot to Brandon too. Hey, you didn't have to show up. Yeah. Even though he did show up, he didn't have to talk to me and hype me up. And you know him a lot more than I do, but I don't think he's the type of guy to hype he's people not. up. It's so insignificant, and it's just a turn of phrase, but Brandon clarifying that between the two of them, Tanir knows Ted, her dad, better, was so funny to me. Unfortunately, those collabs that Tanir and possibly Ted are looking forward to might not happen. Brandon reveals that though his heart wants to stay in Miami, he intends to sign the contract with Secure the Bag Records and move to Tampa. Once again, Tanir encourages Brandon not to leave Miami, but it seems like his mind is made up and he's already spent his signing bonus. The Focus launch party is a winter wonderland, and seems to be organized by the same woman who planned the Emerald Ray Botanicals launch last episode. There's ice sculptures, fake snow, and Jordana in an expensive looking white dress. Initially, I think the dress is a Focus original because of the feathery neckline, but I guess it isn't? What up, Jordan? You look gorgeous. Thank you for my dress. You're welcome. Yeah, of course, always. Are you excited? Yeah. Uh -huh. Sam obviously likes animals, so I'll assume the feathers on the dress are fake, even though it's not from the Focus collection. But how funny would it be if he bought Jordana a dress with real feathers to wear to their faux fur party? This conversation is Sam and Jordana's first interaction since the kiss because they've put off talking as long as they reasonably can. Jordana tells Sam that their friendship is number one. In response, he asks her to dinner the next night. She accepts. Elsewhere, Juliet hangs out with her publicists, Dara and Gwen, who were both inexplicably at the Focus launch party. Dara asks if Juliet feels awkward being at the same event as her ex-boyfriend. But Juliet explains that dating Sam wasn't right for her. So no, it's not awkward at all. Also, she's been to like eight other parties with him throughout the season. I'm like you guys. You guys are such forces in your careers. I want to be that. Therefore, I cannot afford to have a man holding me back. Like, I can't have that. Your man should be supportive. Safety net. 
Impressed by her boss babe attitude, Dara and Gwen offer Juliet a job working with their PR firm. That way, she can learn how to promote JMP on her own. Juliet excitedly accepts. But why would a PR firm want to teach its client how to do their own PR? Later, Juliet approaches Chloe for another round of Can you please acknowledge that you're judgmental? Chloe responds with another round of deflection. Don't you think sometimes you can be a little judgmental? But how is me saying that my husband films because he wants to support me? That's just factual. I wish your boyfriend would support you. It's like, how is it a bad thing that I want better for my best friend? After Chloe says something that I replayed several times, and I still don't understand it. It's like, I can't determine how our relationship is on how What's you're feeling. On? Isn't how you make someone feel the main thing that determines what your relationship with them is like? Juliet and Chloe argue about whether or not Clark is a supportive boyfriend as Amanda joins the conversation. Even though last episode, Chloe couldn't look at Amanda without rolling her eyes, now Amanda defends Chloe for being well-intentioned in her anti-Clarkness. Jules, okay, I will admit when Chloe is coming on too strong, she's coming from a good place right now. And it, there is nothing wrong with Clark being the time, however, this is a big part of your life. Once again, I feel the narrative rug being pulled out from under me. First, Sam's bikini snatching was secretly a storyline about Jordana crushing on him. And now, is Chloe's judginess secretly a storyline about Clark being a bad boyfriend? We'll never know, because Juliet quickly changes the subject. She urges Amanda and Chloe to stop their petty fighting for the sake of their sisterhood. Amanda agrees and apologizes. Chloe offers what I think is her version of an apology. It just doesn't include the word sorry. The one thing about like our friendship is we love hard and we hurt hard. And I, I really want us to stop that. We're all sisters, hands in. With the drama out of the way, it's time to focus on focus. We see a fashion show of all the garments set naturally to Ariana Grande's Focus. After Brandon and Tanir, also wearing Focus, perform their song. It's a hit! The cast compliments Tanir's voice, because she has a great one, and tells Brandon it's their favorite song he's ever made. Probably because it has the highest production quality behind it, and because he only raps one verse. It's the night after the Focus launch party. Time for Sam and Jordana's dinner date. Even though Sam's homebody status has been a plot point throughout the season, I expected him to take Jordana to a fancy restaurant. Instead, like a homebody, he sets up a poolside table in his backyard and lights some candles. To be fair, if you lived in Sam's home, then I'd get why your body might not want to leave. As for the meal itself, Sam hires a private chef, 
hoping it's the sort of grand gesture that'll show Jordana how important she is to him. Maybe I'm being too hard on Sam, but I think cooking for Jordana himself, even if he could only make something simple like a grilled cheese, is a more special gesture. Sam can hire a private chef any day of the week, and probably does. Over dinner, Sam tells Jordana that the thought of her moving out is upsetting. He wants to verbally express his feelings for her, but doesn't know how. Then he proceeds to verbally express his feelings for her. Just like such a caring person, it's so rare to find, and I never see someone like my mom in like another individual. You see your mom in me? Yes, you're like a very caring, nurturing That's person sweet. who like could like mother my kids, which like I don't want kids or anything like that right now, but like. It's probably the most consecutive words Sam's ever said on the show. And as such, it reveals more about him than I've learned any other time he was on screen. Like for real though, like right? Like it's, my mom set the bar way too high. I mean, <clears throat> she said, like, you may be the one I'm... I mean, I've known that. So, does Sam want Jordana to live with him because he values their friendship? Or is he just searching for a surrogate mother? With the realization that, seemingly, Sam compares every woman he meets to his mom... It's hard not to assume the latter. In response to all that, Jordana tells Sam that though she does want to date him, the timing isn't right, and it won't be as long as they're living together. Well, I understand. I just, I think the timing isn't right. entire season built up the narrative that Sam and Jordana are secretly in love. Eventually, Jordana confesses to Sam that she is into him. They share a sloppy public makeout. Then Jordana changes her mind and wants to distance herself from Sam instead. So, like, you don't want to date. I kind of, like, thought that's what you wanted. It is, but at the same time, I don't know if that's good for us right now. Though I like this ending for Jordana much better than if she became Sam's girlfriend, and though people change their mind about crushes all the time, from a narrative perspective, it's a very abrupt ending to a storyline that sucked up a lot of airtime throughout the season. In the season's final scene, everyone who appears in the show's opening credits, except Sam, meets for brunch. That's Juliet, Chloe, Amanda, Madison, Brandon, Jordana, and Kara in her first appearance in five episodes, not counting this random shot of her from the Focus launch party. It was sort of surreal to see this much of the cast gathered at an event other than a party of the week. Because even though this show is supposed to be about a friend group, a lot of them rarely hang out with one another. We learn that most of the group will leave Miami in the coming days to continue on their individual journeys. As we go down the line hearing where people are headed, Brandon offers everyone water while saying the word water. And it's my favorite thing that happens in the episode. I also have photos at the party. Oh, yeah. Oh. Who wants to see? Oh. If you guys want the ones of you, Waters. take them. Water. It was really fun. Waters. The event was amazing. I was really Waters. impressed. Thank you. Brandon? Water. Turns out, Kara's been absent from the show because she's been in Tampa, attending nursing school and looking at houses with her boyfriend, Michael. Brandon announces that he is moving to Tampa, too, to start work with Secure the Bag Records. He insists that he took the deal for the opportunity, 
not the money. But when he talked to Tanir earlier, didn't he cite getting the money and having someone invest money in him as reasons he wanted to sign? I think I might just drive to Tampa and sign the deal from Secure the Bag. Like my head's saying, go get this money, go to where the opportunity is, go to where someone's putting money behind you. The group asks Brandon about moving away from his son Quincy, and his response is, once again, a little too happy. Yeah, what about Quincy? Quincy would have to come visit me in Tampa. Go oh, ahead. Yeah, that's great. Shouldn't Brandon plan trips to visit Quincy? The way he words it, it's like he expects his toddler-aged son to hop on the Megabus every other weekend. With two cast members on their way to Tampa, I was more convinced than ever that the show was setting up another potential rebrand. But my bubble was quickly burst by Amanda. I thought she was also moving to Tampa, per her conversation with Juliet last episode. But instead, Amanda plans to pursue work in the commercial and advertising industries in St. Petersburg, Florida. Seemingly, St. Pete to the locals, which I am not. It's unclear if Amanda will be directing commercials, if she'll be in charge of cinematography, if she'll start as a PA or something else. But commercial work is a gig that keeps on giving. So I think it's a smart choice for a recent grad with a film degree, which I am not, but I was eight years ago. Chloe and her husband Chris are moving too, but back to Siesta Key. Chloe hopes to be there for about a year and a half while Chris works in real estate. Then she wants to start having kids, but I guess not in Siesta Key. Madison reveals that she and her husband, Ish, are also returning to Siesta Key. We already learned that last episode, but the cast didn't because they don't hang out. Juliet and Jordana are the only two staying in Miami. Juliet plans to split her time between JMP and the PR job Dara and Gwen offered her. Jordana also wants to dual work, partly on focus and partly on her art career. She's even got an interview at a gallery to do something. She also reveals that she's decided to move out of Sam's house. And there was much rejoicing. <laughs> the group reflects on their growth, both as individuals and as friends who started filming a TV show together five years ago. We see the first of many montages. This one features the full cast through all five seasons of the show. I've been traveling a dark and murky, muddy mess. I've been dreading it. But believe it's gotta kill me to stop me. I'm not stopping. I rise above the enemy on angel wings that carry me. One by one, people start to depart. First, Kara leaves for Tampa. Then it's Jordana's turn. Now it's just the five remaining original cast members. Juliet, Chloe, Amanda, Madison, and Brandon. They cheers to the next chapter and to themselves, the OGs. And then there were five. Wow. To the next chapter. To the next chapter. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers guys, OGs. Next, it's Brandon's turn to go. He needs to pick up Quincy. As he exits, we're subjected to an all-Brandon montage. For some reason, it's immediately followed by a montage of footage just from this season. I never want to leave this sunset town, but one day the time may come, and I'll take you at your word and carry on. I'll hate the goodbye. 
Amanda remarks that this brunch could be the last time the cast is all together. Then she and Madison leave too. Cue another two montages, one dedicated to each of them. But I won't forget the good times. So glad they reminded us of that important moment when Amanda licked a glass. Finally, just Juliet and Chloe are left. They cry together and reminisce about being 17 and 18 years old when the original pilot was filmed. Which I would love to watch, by the way, if anyone still has access to it. We see a montage of Juliet and Chloe together. Then another one of just Chloe as she leaves the scene too. My name's Juliet and I was born and raised in CSG. And you were like, what's this show gonna be? I never wanna leave this sunset town But one day the time may come Next, there's an all Juliet montage followed by another full cast montage. But that's the last one, I swear. In the season's, possibly the series, final moments, Juliet's voiceover tells us that she's excited for what the future brings, but on her terms. She ignores a phone call from Clark, then adds, After all, as I told you way back in the beginning, paradise is never what it seems. And I was excited for what the future would bring but on my terms. After all, as I told you way back in the beginning, <laughs> paradise is never what it seems. Juliet sighs, then sits silently, taking in the Miami skyline. We sit with her for a moment longer, and that's that. Kind of a strange ending, right? Initially, Clark's disinterest in filming was a source of tension between him and Juliet. But about halfway through the season, she realized that not bringing cameras, drama, and fake fights into their relationship was actually a good thing, and that he could still be an attentive boyfriend without joining the cast. That seemed like the end of the storyline, until questions about Clark's supportiveness resurfaced as part of the judgmental Chloe arc. And now, with its final moments, possibly ever, the show ominously insinuates that Juliet and Clark's relationship is secretly in shambles under the surface. Considering that she and Clark are still together, I have to wonder if Juliet knew the producers planned to end the season like this. Or does she just glaze over and record her voiceover lines in as close to one take as possible? I mean, how do we even know that it's Juliet's hands ignoring the call from Clark? Those could be anybody's fingers. At the same time, Introducing an ambiguous plot point that may or may not be completely fake is kind of the perfect way for Siesta Key to end. Thanks for watching and for sticking with me through another season of The Recap Corner. Siesta Key Miami Moves is like Morgan's doll in Boy Meets World after she puts it in the toaster a weird, melted version of itself. 
Most other Siesta Key seasons included a mid-season finale, and about 20 episodes in total. But not season 5. And instead of relationship drama or fights between friends, season 5 mostly saw people trying to start businesses. It felt like the cast was suddenly attempting to set themselves up for life after Siesta Key. Hence, the constant launch parties. We saw eight in 12 episodes. But it's no surprise that the cast members are trying to secure new income, because several of them seemed to be actively rooting for the show's cancellation. Kara wrote on Instagram that she hoped the series would end after five seasons. Brandon called the producers corny, corn-on-the-cob eaters. I'm paraphrasing, but not as much as you might think. Why are the producers corny? Why are the producers corny? Because they eat fucking corn on the cob all day long. They don't roll what's real. I'm sorry, fire me. Fire me if you want, but they don't roll what's real. They roll with the bullshit. They roll with the corn shit. Like, the corny shit. I'm sorry, fire me if you want. I don't care. I got three businesses. I'm good. And when a podcaster described Siesta Key as a Laguna Beach reboot, Juliet replied, Yeah, but Siesta Key doesn't hit the same. I can't say I disagree with Juliet, but I also want Siesta Key to be renewed for a sixth season. Up until a few weeks ago, I was hopeful there'd be a season 5B. Miami Moves, though repetitive and maybe a little boring at times, was also silly and surreal and made me laugh a lot. I'm curious to see what other convoluted rebrands the producers could come up with, and I hope we get to see them all. If there ever is more Siesta Key, then I'll definitely be back to recap it. I hope all of you who have been watching and commenting will be back too. It's a lot of fun reading your opinions, and I'm so grateful that so many of you have taken the time to chat with me about the show, especially because I'm the only person I know who watches it. Until then, I'm hoping to make some longer videos about the early challenge seasons that aren't available to stream. I also just heard about a dating show called Farmer Wants a Wife that's premiering on Fox in early March. It looks like it might be fun to recap. It also looks like it might be terrible, but in a bad sort of way. We'll find out! In the meantime, if you're so inclined, please like and subscribe. Thanks again, and thanks to the Siesta Keisters for making the closest thing to Laguna Beach since the original. Even if Siesta Key didn't hit quite the same. See you next time. Bye! Right